Good day grade 12s. My name is Viola from the Distinction Bound Student and I'd like to welcome you to possible essay number 2. I'll hand over the lesson to Cardin. Over to you Cardin. Right, so the new economic paradigm, let's have a look. In this, uh, which we otherwise call it, call a way of thinking, government tries to focus less on fine tuning and more on eliminating any uncertainties with regards to the fiscal and the monetary policy. And government does that by looking at demand and supply side. So let's have a look at demand side policy. Precisely, a demand side, a demand side, side policy, it is a policy that uh, stimulates aggregate demand. So in other words, if we have two main uh, participants we have um, no, no, consumers, okay, but let me call them households. So we have us households and we also have another participant, which is businesses or firms. All right, so we are the main consumers of goods and services. So we are the main people who demand. Of course, we are not the only ones, you know. Government does demand goods and services as well and so on so and even firms themselves they buy things from other firms so they also demand they also stimulate aggregate demand but the main consumers of goods and services is us then on the other hand you would find households like people individuals not doing it as a business producing something it doesn't make us the primary producers the primary producers are the businesses so these ones are the ones that are responsible for supply so any demand side policy is sort of mainly looking at households so this policy is trying to say what is it that we can do that can stimulate aggregate demand what we mean by stimulation of aggregate demand is this simply shifting the demand curve to the right so this is what we mean then on the other hand, we have the supply curve. Like I said, who is responsible for the supply curve? That will be the businesses. And you look at this one, the demand curve, as we go from here to here, what is it? It's downward sloping. The supply curve, look at it, it's upward sloping. So an increase in supply is merely a shift of the supply curve to the right. So we have S1. So in both cases, uh, any policy that, oh, a policy that stimulates aggregate demand is a demand side policy. As a policy that makes businesses manufacture more, it's a supply side policy. So government is trying to, uh, you know, eliminate uncertainties with regards to the fiscal and the monetary policy so they do this by looking at demand and supply side policies so let's have a look at how they actually do it so this needs to be done during a recession for instance or during a period of um a below the trend growth uh, even even let's say okay where is my mouse okay look this is our cycle right and then we have a trend line so government can do it at any point below this thing this trend line that's what we mean by that all right so if there is a spare capacity then demand side policies can play a role in increasing the rate of economic growth however if the economy is already close to full capacity that is a trend uh, trend rate of growth a, a further increase in aggregate demand will mainly cause inflation which is a big problem these monetary and fiscal policies are implemented with the aim of increasing aggregate demand like i said on the output produced by domestic firms in order to stimulate economic growth right so basically this is how it's done so government look the the thing is government wants to increase this right government wants to achieve real growth in gdp so here we have aggregate income here why so how do we have aggregate income anyway we know that uh, income is equal to production it's equal to expenditure so when when we do anything that increases aggregate income in other words we're increasing 
production we are increasing expenditure so it doesn't matter which method of you calculating gdp we use uh the, here we see that what we are saying here is an increase in aggregate income means an increase in real gdp so any demand side policy will result in aggregate demand shifting from ad to ad1 the ad stands for aggregate demand simple all right so let's look at the monetary policy like how can it be used uh like i said before but anyway i've explained it expansionary monetary policy this one is done by okay we have money supply we have the repo rate uh what do we do with money supply if we want to be expansionary and by the way when are we expansionary we are expansionary during a downswing so what do we do to money supply we increase it what do we do to interest rates we decrease interest rates right uh this activity by the reserve bank will increase demand for goods and services because uh, an increase in money supply means there's more money in circulation a decrease in the repo rate means credit is cheap so when credit is cheap people go out and borrow and uh, then you know that they they borrow that money and they use the money to do economic activity you you go and borrow some money one million rent you start a business you employ people those newly employed you see it causes the multiply effect so at the end of the day uh, this act by the reserve bank is um an expansionary a way uh, which will increase in an increase in aggregate demand then the opposite is restrictive which would make sense to be restrictive during an upswing so this is done by doing the opposite look here increasing interest rates so that is this and reducing money supply that is this so it is merely the opposite and then the fiscal policy can also be uh, expansionary and can also be restrictive i'm not going into detail because this is a repetition we've been doing this and and so here expansionary or a restrictive so the same is done look here expenditure goes down tax goes up and then here uh where is it tech goes down and so when expenditure goes up what are we doing we are being expansionary and when taxes go up what are we doing we are being restrictive because how because when tax goes up there is less money in our pockets when tax goes down there is more money in our pockets so it's a simple if we look at these words leakages injections if you look at this you will see that it it makes absolute sense All right then we have supply side policies like i said these are policies that are mainly that that will not increase our willingness to buy but these policies will make businesses be more willing to produce so supply is going to increase so what is it that government can do number one government can uh, try to increase the efficiency of markets to make them more competitive so yes we all know the competition commission appeal court or tribunal oh sorry I forget that uh, you know this is term one and you haven't done markets so you probably wouldn't know the competition commission sorry all right but anyway uh, the, the the supply side policies will will stimulate supply aggregate supply so how can government do this uh, government can do this by deregulation and let me try to think of a weird example let's say for instance uh for you to be able to sell maguinha okay maguinha is fat cook to those of you who don't know all right the like mostly uh, i i live in pretoria and in most cases you would see uh people selling maguinha in the morning uh you'll find them by street corners and so on so they make those fat cooks uh in the morning and people it's, it's a big market people buy but you you can clearly see that that type of business is um informal right let's say for instance uh government tries to be you know um to be strict and then they start saying to those people you cannot sell maguinha unless you have a license and then okay so they're trying to regulate them the the, the this particular market 
uh, they say, okay, you need a trading license. You need to register a business. Okay. Uh, that is putting regulation unnecessarily in a way. Look at it. Okay. Some people will say, okay, fine. We, it's, it's our own, only option. They go out and register companies. Now the problem could come when it's getting a license, let's say. So now they need a license. Then they go to, let's say, city of Tuani to apply for the license. And then they are told that the license costs 10,000 and it will take two years to come out. Do you think you'd pay 10,000 to start a Maguinha business to, to just have a street corner outside there? They, they don't build anything for you, but to just say, this is your spot. Do you think people would continue to supply that particular, you know, uh, a need. I, I don't think they would. Okay. So deregulation would, would be something like, uh, okay, let's, uh, let's make it simple. Okay, fine. Yes. They'll need a license. Number one, the license is for free. Number two, you go apply for it at eight in the morning by 10 o'clock or by nine o'clock, you have your license. Do you, what do you think would happen to, uh, the supply of Maguinha? Would it go up or it would go down? It definitely would go up if government would like deregulate, if government would re re remove those unnecessary interventions, uh, you know, and, and just let certain things happen. That is going to increase, you know, the supply of whatever it is that businesses would want to supply. I think you understand. The next one is competition. Encourage competition by implementing and monitoring the Competition Act. Uh, this can also be achieved by encouraging and supporting entrepreneurship. Then the next one is privatization. This helps increase competition. That is very true. So in terms of increasing efficiency of markets, we have number one, deregulation. Number two, we have competition. Number three, we have privatization. The next one is decrease in production costs. How do we decrease production costs? Number one, government could subsidize uh, to reduce production costs. So if government subsidizes the production of something, there's going to be an increase in the production of that particular item. Now, if, if me saying what I'm saying, what do you see? You see simply a shift of the supply curve to S1. Okay, like that. The next one, decrease administrative costs, red tap. This is, you know, uh, more or less the same as what I was talking about with deregulation. Then the last thing, uh, oh, with this regard is increasing the efficiency of inputs. This can be done by decreasing tax and encouraging firms to use modern technology. Oh, I forgot. Improve the quality of human resource through the Skills Development Act and then provide free advisory services. All right, so this is what we have. We want to increase um, income. Uh, where's my mouse? Okay, there. Yes, this one, income from Y1, Y to Y1. Okay, and by so doing, we're increasing real GDP. So we're trying to achieve economic growth. And how are we doing it? We are using supply side policy. And then you can see as a result, supply shifts, you know, so it's a policy that is going to increase aggregate supply, but yes, it's going to cause price to go down. The other one that we saw back there, which is the demand side policy, it will cause price to go up. All right. So, but if you have them together, something like this. All right. Let's have a look at what would happen. Let's say this is our price. This is our quantity. Oh, this is our Y. Then we implement our demand side policy. Okay. Uh, let's say we implement our demand side policy. Then we have D1 and we have D1 like that. Do you see what would happen? Price would go up. Ne? But another side, but, but anyway, the thing that we are looking for is this one an increase in aggregate, uh, oh, an increase in national uh, in, in real GDP or, or aggregate income. So we see this increase, ne? but l a supply side policy, like something like this, you see, aggregate supply 
has shifted to S1 from S. So if we look here, look, it cancels out the price. The price remains sort of the same. Yeah. So you'd have other textbooks explaining it this way, but uh, I had it the opposite. All right. So then the effect of the demand and supply side policies, inflation, the policies can cause output to increase without causing prices to go up. Supply is often uh, sticky and fixed in short term. Supply side measures make supply more flexible. And then unemployment, demand side policies increase demand for labor, which reduces unemployment. And then uh, last but not least, let's look at the Phillips curve. So the Phillips curve represents the relationship between the rate of inflation and the unemployment rate. The curve suggested that uh, changes in the level of unemployment have a direct and predictable effect. Like you can actually predict the effect on the level of, um, of, of inflation. This suggests uh, policymakers have a choice. Anyway, it wouldn't be economics if it wasn't for choice. Uh, and, and we choose because, you know, in this case, we, we, whatever it is, like it's predictable that a policy that we implement is going to either increase inflation, which is a bad thing, but uh, that policy will be something that is dealing with unemployment. And so it is going to reduce unemployment, which is a good thing. So there's that trade off when we implement a policy that deals with this, we are giving up on the other. And if we do the opposite, unemployment is going to be bad, as in it's going to increase, but inflation is going to go down, which is a good thing. So should we go for inflation and kill unemployment or we, 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 we go for unemployment and kill inflation? So policymakers, the Phillips curve is simply trying to, uh, uh, you know, explain that trade off. So during the 1950s and 60s, Phillips curve analysis suggested uh, there was a trade off, meaning uh, it's either you take unemployment or inflation. So there's that trade off and policymakers could use demand uh, management. That is the fiscal and monetary policy to try and influence the rate of economic growth and inflation. For example, if unemployment was high, let's say 20%, you're going to see it in on the Phillips curve on the next slide just now. If unemployment was high, let's say 20%, and inflation was low, let's say 2%, what would you say here? You would say unemployment is bad, and you'd say inflation is good, right? Policymakers could stimulate aggregate demand, which is a good thing. <laughs> this would reduce unemployment okay so this thing goes down 20 percent it goes down let's say to five percent oh so what happens now to unemployment unemployment is now good but caused a high inflation of eight percent this is bad exactly what i was explaining so uh here's what we mean let's say at this point you see here uh we have two percent what inflation rate which is a very good inflation rate but the problem is unemployment is 20 percent which is very bad so when policymakers do something that will reduce because going this way is good in terms of unemployment reducing unemployment okay so let's say we manage to reduce unemployment this is a good thing but then we now have a problem of a high inflation rate which is bad so that's what we mean by there is this trade-off will you prioritize inflation over unemployment or unemployment over inflation so that will be the debate policymakers will find difficult to solve so the the accepted explanation during the 1960s was that the fiscal stimulus and um an increase in aggregate demand would trigger the following sequence of responses. Number one, an increase in the demand for labor as government spending uh, generate growth. 
the pool of unemployed will fall, the f then firms must compete for fewer workers by raising normal wages. And then workers have greater bargaining power to seek out increase in normal wages. And then wage costs will rise. This would lead to cost push inflation. Over to you, Viola. Thanks, Cardin. Our next lesson will be on business cycles and it says discuss in detail features underpinning forecasting. 26 marks. That's it for today's essay. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Also hit the notification bell for you to get notified every time we post new content to our channel. We are also giving away the Distinction Bound Student t-shirts to people who buy more than 10 books. At the moment we have the following textbooks, Economics Grade 10, 11 and 12 plus Business Studies Grades 11 and 12. We are looking forward to adding more books to our catalog. Remember our books come in two versions, Complete and No Answers versions. Complete versions have answers and No Answers versions do not. Thank you so much for your support. See you in the next video. God bless. Thank <laughs> you.